Well, hey, thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to the Next Boots podcast uh, from start to finish. I'm your host, Tyler Mao, and I have got the very esteemed guest, um, Weston K of Rose Anvil. Uh, many ventures, right? The YouTube channel, the uh, small goods uh, manufacturing operation, and probably a lot more than that as well that I'm missing here. Um, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming on, Weston. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Well, uh, you know, we've we've had a pretty good relationship over the last few years, so I'm happy to be on anytime you guys want. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and that's that's the truth. You know, like I was thinking about like what angle to take on this, and I think I'd love to talk about the YouTube business a little bit with you because okay. I think that's been a, an important part of both of our businesses over the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. Um, but also reminisce a little bit about, um, you know, how we all got started. You know, I mean, um, it was May 2020, right? Yeah, yeah, because that was that was right during the pandemic. And that's when I, I had really focused on the YouTube channel at, because at the time, our biggest seller was the camera harnesses. And we were predominantly selling them to the wedding photographers and the wedding industry died, especially for like these destination weddings where they're, they're needing a more ergonomic, uh, almost backpack style camera harness that you could, you could hook your cameras to your hips so you could actually hike around. All that just died off. And so I was like, okay, what do I do? You know, I've got employees to keep busy at the time when I had like, I think I had like one or two employees. And uh, so I was like, well, we'll keep him busy for a couple of weeks with this little project. And um, my good buddy, Jerry Rig Everything is his channel. His name's Zach. And he uh, he had at the time about 5 million subscribers. And his channel is all about taking the most recent tech and tearing it apart and checking to make sure brands are being honest about the quality of glass, the quality of processors, the uh, battery size, and and uh, just like all the internal components that you can't really test or see unless you tear the phone apart. That was his formula that made him a huge following and lots and lots of money, I'm assuming. And so I was like, you know, maybe he knows something. Let me ask Zach what's going on. And I was like, Zach, what do I do? Coronavirus is here. It's probably gonna last two weeks, but for the two weeks, in, in quotations, you know, what, what do I do for a YouTube channel? Got any ideas for me? And he's like, honestly, just do what I do, but with your industry. And I was like, okay, I could do that. You know, I could tear apart some wallets or I could tear apart, you know, maybe a boot or two. I didn't know as, I didn't know nearly as much about boots as I do now, obviously, but I was like, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's cut apart a boot and just see what happens. And that's why, that's when we cut apart the very first pair of Doc Martens and it didn't blow up. Really, you know, for the time it felt like it blew up because it had a, overnight it got like 500 views. And I was like, oh my gosh, 500 views. This thing is blowing up. We're like, you know, like this is a big deal. And then the next day it, it went, went up by a thousand views. I was like, okay, um, this is maybe going to actually blow up. And then it kind of petered off a little bit. But I was like, at least there was some amount of excitement there that I could point to to say, like, I think this is worth investing in and trying again with another pair of docs or something. And so, now we fast forward a few years. It's kind of funny because we just re redid the Doc Martin boots over again, going from like less than 10,000 subscribers now up to almost a million subscribers, comparing and contrasting how the videos are completely different. Because at the time I was doing, I was just shouting into the void. I thought they're going to get like 100 views. And now people are like, your old videos, you said this, this, and this. I was like, yeah, because it was three years ago and I thought it was going to get like 100 views and that I, we didn't know that three years from now it was going to have 2 million views. And so that was the era that we started working together was right after that. So I had maybe done like eight or nine videos and cutting stuff in half and we, we, we had felt like it was, it was at a point where I could start charging for it because I was like, sure. I could start to see the value and see the traffic that was coming in and I saw a future in it. And so, you know, we started reaching out to some companies and maybe 15 videos in is my guess of when you, I think you guys reached out to me. Yeah, I was after the, um, I saw the Iron Ranger video. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was still pretty early. Yeah. And uh, actually my dad saw it, which was kind of funny. And he was like, hey, this guy would be perfect, <laughs> you know? And I was like, Gosh, you're right. Um, and yeah, you guys were, I mean, it was super easy to work with you guys. It's not, it's not always the case with, uh, with everybody. And so that right. was a real, real blessing. Uh, yeah. Cause at the time the, you guys you're talking about was literally like just me. Cause the YouTube channel was a after work project. Like after the eight hour shift, I was like, Oh, let's make some YouTube videos. 
because my good buddy, Zach, he's got this huge channel. One of my roommates had a YouTube channel. So I was like, I might as well try. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And so back then, you know, it was like, it was literally just me for the first year working after an eight hour shift until like 2 a.m. sometimes. That's why in our first few videos we did together, it was like, hey, uh, this is going live tomorrow. Here's the draft, it's 4 a.m. Can you approve this? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that, we've definitely streamlined things quite a bit more in the in the recent years so it's a yeah. lot less 4 a.m's and, and all night events trying to get these videos done yeah no it's quite the journey you've been on um and it's been really awesome to see that like um you branched down into a few other i remember motorcycles in particular is that still happening like like have you Talk to me about how difficult it is to maybe branch out into different content or different formats, because I know we've experienced a similar thing. Yeah, well, motorcycles, motorcycles, they've always been a part of the brand since even before the cameras, because the first two or three years of the business, I basically paid for the business by refurbishing, flipping motorcycles, building custom builds, cafe racers, um, you know, getting a $300 bike, buying it for $250, you know, getting them down on the price, then spending that extra $50 on a carb rebuild, rebuilding the carbs. They run like a dream. I sell them for a thousand bucks. I, I, I net 700 bucks, you sure. know, so early, early on. And even still, I love motorcycles. I've got a couple Harleys. I've got some, I've got two triumphs that will probably never get finished. And so, you know, for me, it was an easy, an easy thing to keep somewhat around the business, like some of our B-rolls around it. Um, some of our like content that we shoot is still motorcycle directed from time to time. But the, the thing that you're referring to, I think is when we, we did a motorcycle build on the channel and that whole thing was a, a cluster fluff because I, I, I still think if we would have done it right, it had some legs because the idea behind it was we're going to make a four part series showing you from start to finish what it's like to build a chopper in your garage, like basically from scratch. Episode one is going to be tearing down the motorcycle. So starting with the bagged out Harley, uh, removing all the fairing in the bags and the frames, getting it down to just like bare minimum. That was episode one. Episode two was going to be taking all the remaining bits off, painting everything, getting all the like the fab, maybe not painting yet. I think the fab work was episode two. Episode three was painting and episode four um, was like the final touches and then like a riding off into the, the sunset type of situation. Um, but the problem was the guys that were working for me at the time, the first video went perfectly. They shot everything, everything went smooth, but uh, um, videos two, three, and four were very much a hangout in the shop. Let's drink some beers. Let's uh, take this thing a little bit casually. And it got taken a little too casually and only about a third of the footage got shot. And then we lost one of our GoPros that had the, a third of the third of the footage. And so we ended up with this four part series that I thought was gonna be a really cool in-depth dive into motorcycle building. Really turned out to be like a four, three part series of five minutes of kind of showing how to build a motorcycle. So that was a, $15,000 hole that I never yet to dig myself out of. But I still think, I think there's some legs there. It just, it just wasn't the right timing. And it, and it, and I'm not necessarily blaming the guys that shot it because I should have, I should have uh, structured it more and told them exactly what I was looking for. But uh, yeah, I don't know. So I tried, but it just didn't work. And, and so I, I think the, the maybe, part of the question that you had behind that was like, why didn't it work? Is that kind of what you're wondering? Well, I'm also just wondering like, you know, so we've got the how it's made, you know, videos and those are kind of the bread and butter of what we do. Um, and we've tried other like animations, like, you know, showing things coming together in different ways um, and just a different approach and they never do as well. And, um, you know, whatever we try out, I think, I think it's very cool. And sometimes it's even more like higher production value, but it just doesn't seem to scratch the itch of the people that, you know, YouTube sends to us, you know? And so, yeah. uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious about, cause that kind of comes into my next question, which is about like something, you know, I've never really dug into the YouTube analytics, which I think is probably a good idea, but yeah, like, I'd um, say so. <clears throat> but like, um, we look at like, what portion of our viewership is coming from like 
are subscription based versus like the recommendation engines. It's a you know for us it's it's quite a bit um, high higher on the recommendation engine side. And I was kind of curious how that was for you because you do have the kind of the personality behind the brand and everything. I imagine it'd be a little bit higher for you. Um, how important is that subscription base for your for your viewership and you know how you do? Yeah, it's it's, it's a difficult question because you you're always playing a guessing game with YouTube. They they like to pretend like they give you the information you need to success to succeed on their platform, but they don't. They just tell you like, oh yeah, we like videos that do well. You're like, ah, oh, sick. Thank you for the advice. Love it. You know. Um, and so when it comes to like the viewership and like the viewer base, I still think the vast majority of our views come from the browse feature. But the way I view how our videos work is. From from time zero, the moment the video launches, for the first like 48 hours, it's mostly going to our viewers, our subscribers. And so the, w the way that YouTube u runs their algorithm is they use your subscriber base to test the product essentially, to see uh, if it's a viable product for a bigger audience. And so those first 48 hours, it's just throwing it to a few different groups of people within your own subscriber base. And then it takes that information, as far as I understand, and they take it to a bigger audience. And if that is replicatable, if, it, if the success is still there, then it takes it to a bigger audience, bigger, 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 until all of a sudden you're viral. And so it's it's a tricky thing to do to try to, to balance keeping your, fo your following happy and the content they wanna see while still making it mainstream enough and big enough that it can catch the algorithm and, and hopefully get you millions of views. So it's yeah. a it's a delicate balance, but I would say like the analytics, we because and and I know you're this way with your business is you're a very data driven person, and so sure. from the YouTube side of things, we do things very data driven as well on that side. Like we're always looking at our click through rates, we're looking at our relative attention, where that bar that shows like where people are dropping off and where they're they're the most interesting parts of the videos are, and we're just constantly optimizing for the algorithm because we're at the whim of, of YouTube. You know, we've and got, should, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was, just, no, I was gonna say, I should clarify, like I I don't look at the analytics, but I know our people do. So that's, mm. that was kind of what I was, was saying. I know I'm not trying okay. to put Nathan to the bus here or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, come on, Nathan, step up your game. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's a great answer and I, I appreciate that. Um, I do think the YouTube business is kind of fascinating, right? Because it also, like another question I have is like, I have to imagine, you know, I bet your CPMs are better than ours, but like um, I'm imagining most of your business comes from the sponsorship side, right? Versus like- Yeah, the so here. CPM, just to, to uh, let everyone know that has no idea what we're talking about is cost per milla, I believe. Per Basically thousand. how <laughs> much money you get per thousand views. Um, when it comes to like the ad revenue, the ads that play in front of your videos, not necessarily the integrated ads where it's the person talking in front of the camera about a, a, a product in the video, right? Is that what we're talking about? Exactly. So yeah, we, um, our CPMs are probably a little bit higher, but that's because we're in the fashion industry. You know, like people are coming to watch our videos because they're looking for fashion or looking for style. And so the way that CPMs are are determined and basically how much money you're getting per ad played in front of your video is it's a bidding system. And Shiloh, you already, you already know this, but I'm just describing it to the audience where there it's a bidding system where there's probably, let's say 20, 20 different brands trying to get an ad in front of a video about something in fashion, particular maybe like the fashion or the fashion footwear world. Well, those 20 um, different companies trying to advertise in front of your video, there's an automatic bidding system and the highest bidder gets that spot. So depending on when the ad is played, what the content is, how successful the content is, will determine along with the bidding system what your CPM is. And so for us being in the fashion industry, a lot of times it's a pretty competitive one, especially in quarter three and quarter four of the year, because that's when everyone's buying their back to school clothes, their holiday shopping, winter's around the corner, so they're shopping. And um, so we just, we play with our, our content accordingly. You know, when it starts getting a little bit more fall, we start doing more boot content. And then we start hitting some of the big mainstream content that maybe our main subscriber base doesn't care about, but the general audience of the world will care about. And that seems to keep our CPM at a pretty decent rate. Yeah, I, I kind of my other question was like, so I've, I've read that like financial advice, um, 
channels typically have the highest CPMs because, you know, oh, you can really? get to, like sign up for like a Vanguard ETF or like, you know, a 401k or something like that. And that has like a much long, like basically the highest lifetime value for a customer. Okay. Um, also like car, you know, car focused ones. Yeah, I know tech's curious. super high too, because tech, yep. I, I've, re, I've, re, I've like reviewed our CPM compared to JRig everything. And I'll tell you what, if there's a bidding war going on, the biggest ones up there are the one Apple versus Samsung versus Microsoft oh, sure. versus Apple. And so those get bid right to the top. Yeah, phones. I mean, you know, you're talking about hooking somebody for like 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I was just kind of curious if that's ever come into your thought process. Like I was thinking like the motorcycle thing, like, hey, like. I bet, you know, motorcycle companies pay more to get people to buy motorcycles than boot companies pay people to get boot, buy boots, right? Just because it's a larger transaction price. I was just kind of curious if that's ever come into your thought process on what kind of content that you would develop or what type of directions you would think about going in. Yeah, most of what we just, when we come, when it comes to like deciding on the content, it's 50% whatever I'm interested in at the time. Like, I just hate making content I'm not interested in. And the other half is, do we think this is going to do well on YouTube? And so we don't really consider the CPM into the actual content deciding. We kind of in a roundabout way we do when we think about how mainstream is this product. And then, then we kind of prioritize it accordingly. But, um, but it's a, it's a, it's obnoxious dealing with YouTube because like, we'll have a swing of like, We'll drop like our our ad revenue month to month will sometimes drop in half from like sure. December to January or January to February. And it's, it sucks as a business owner because you have these guys that you have working for you who are needing hourly, like steady weekly hourly jobs. But your actual income is fluctuating like crazy volatile. And so it's hard to like run a YouTube based business because you are at the whim of YouTube and how much they're going to prioritize your content in their algorithm based off of the recent videos you've done. Maybe some things you said they didn't like or some keywords that that drop your ranking for a month or so. And it's just uh, sucks. I hate that part of it. And that's why we do so many integrated sponsorships, which are the ads where it's me talking in front of the camera uh, at some point throughout the video because that's really what makes the channel possible. Because yep. without if without that, we would just be gambling every single month if we were profitable or if we like lost money. And so the integrated sponsors are the lifeblood of the channel. Got it, got it. Cool, thank you for your frankness there. Um, yeah, I like YouTube, I like, I like all this stuff because I was, a, I was a business major first and foremost, and I had leatherworking and woodworking and metalworking as my passions behind like, my education. And so I love, honest, actually, like I'm just a really lucky person to be completely honest because I, I love everything we do. I love the business side of it. I love the product designing. I like the reviewing side of it. I honestly don't love being in front of the camera as much as I am. Like even for this interview, I've known Shyler for three years now. I still get nervous. Like I still get like a little bit of heart flutters, you know, I still get a little sweaty. I can't help it. I just get nervous in front of the camera. I just, I think it's just part of who I am. I, I would agree. Yeah. Um, you, you would agree I get nervous in front of every... No, I would agree that it was nerve-wracking. Nerve <laughs> yeah. um, this was... I remember we talked about... I mean, that's... It's kind of an interesting dynamic of, like, the personal brand and, like, today's social media environment, you know? Yeah. And it's, you can really leverage it to jumpstart your business or, or your channel, you know, well, which is a business. Um, but it's not really, it's not a natural fit for me, you know, but I'm yeah, like, same. Well, gotta do it. You know, you gotta like, you gotta put yourself out there if you want to, you know, feed, feed the, the people at your table, you know? Uh, yeah. And, it, and it's, it's one of those things too, where it's, I think a lot of people struggle with it because they have a hard time being themselves on camera, not be, be not because they're nervous of the camera, but it, I think it's like a nervousness of being yourself on camera and being vulnerable to the entire world to criticize everything about you. Like oh, yeah. appearance, uh, fashion, how you speak, um, cadence, uh, your point of views on things, your internal philosophy that manifests through every piece of content that you make. You know, you're opening up everything to the world without having any recourse to get to like get that back. You're just like, I hope you like me. I hope you like this content, otherwise, say all the mean shit in the comments inevitably there's going to be people who don't and they're also yeah. the most 
vocal, right? And so you have to like filter that through. Yeah, I. It's it's a lot, man. Um, I, I, I empathize with you on that. You get used to it to some degree, though. You know, like when I first started doing the channel, it used to bug me like crazy when people would talk trash in the comment section. You know, I'd be like, oh, this guy doesn't even know me. Like, how could he say this about me? And then I realized this guy doesn't know me. What do I care? Like, I don't know who he is. <laughs> You know, and it, it gets to a point where, like I was talking about this to the, with the stitch down guys, where you, the sweet spot for me, because there, there's there's two theories, I guess, when it comes to like reading comments for creators. Read every single comment, reply back, be involved in the community, like really be a part of it. And then there's the, the post and ghost type where you're, you just post your videos, you don't interact, you don't read anything. And I, I like to do like something in the middle because I still feel like there's so much valuable information that gets brought to you from your audience. And if you know that it's gonna lean a little bit negative, and as soon as you acquire a little bit of a taste for like, is this guy just hating or is he actually giving feedback? Then you can sort through that stuff. And that's what I like to do is I, I still probably read 90% of the comments, DMs, and emails that come into us because I, I think it's valuable information. I think it's vital. You just have to like, you have to just, bolster yourself up or callous up enough that when people are like, hey, you chicken led piece of shit, and you're like, oh man, you got real right at the core on that one. <laughs> like, how do you know my legs are so skinny? I am a piece of shit, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, on occasion they'll, they'll sting you with a good one and, uh, but you just get over it. It's, it's honestly, I think it's been ultimately beneficial for my own life and my personal mental oh, health. Because sure. when you get exposed to that, you just get th from out of the skillet into the fire type of situation where you're just like, here we are, sink or swim. Like, and it really makes you, the, the thing that's cool about it is it makes you double down on your own self. Like, do I actually believe in what I'm doing? Do I actually have these ethics and these core values that I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to delineate across this entire channel? And, um, and I think what it does too is it allows you to really figure out what is it at the core? What do you actually do here? Like, what is your thing? And uh, so I value it. And I think it can be valuable if you have the right mindset, the right therapy, the right upbringing, whatever it happens to be, you know, cause I was raised in a small town. So I was just, yeah, I was like, I've, I'm used to being chewed out my whole life, you know, cause I played sports all growing up and s sports in rural towns are pretty brutal. Like. Yeah, there were several coaches that physically put hands on me, hit me a few times, you know, and my dad, um, I'm not going to say he hit me per se, but he's, you know, he's, he's a, he's an old farmer. He's, he's a little, uh, he can get a little mean from time to time. And so when it comes to feedback of people I don't know on the internet, writing mean things that they don't fully know me, you, it's, it makes it a little bit easier if you've had a little bit of, uh, ass chewing in your life a few times. <laughs> That, yeah, I would agree. Um, okay, so you talk about the people that you work with. How, how many people do you have now? Um, we have, I think, 10 employees. Wow. We are, yeah, we, we just hired another employee. Actually, we are hiring two new employees just to keep up. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And is that, that's, how, I guess, how do you... Um, differentiate the two parts of the business, the production slash yeah. e-commerce side and then the, the video, video side? Um, I think we do a pretty good job of integrating both of them because one informs the other. Anytime we have a big product sale, we'll talk about it on the channel. Anytime the YouTube channel pops off, a lot of times that manifests on the back end of the business where a lot of orders come through. And so it's pretty easy to keep it integrated but it op the whole business operates with basically three different departments. We've got the production department, we've got the, which I guess maybe a better way to put it is we have the physical goods department, we have the video department, and then we have the social media department. And each one of those has a, a manager on uh, as the lead. And then each of the managers, like I work with them more directly than every, everybody. And so what that allows us to do is have like almost these mini businesses within a single business that operate almost independently, but have each other to rely on and can borrow employees when needed, can borrow marketing power when needed. And, um, and it just, we're just lucky that we were a, a leather working business first by several years. And I, that's where I gained that leather expertise and knowledge from. And so, we are in that, that fortunate situation that a lot of other 
YouTubers aren't, where they'd have to like, okay, I'm successful on YouTube and I'm making some ad revenue. It's super inconsistent and fluctuates. How do I get this into physical goods? What can I make? Then they're trying to make a like a physical goods brands, a brand off of the back of a successful social following. And it's a lot harder way to do it that way. I would agree. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that. Uh, yeah, you guys experience that to some degree too, well, huh? Because no, you. No, I'm not trying to bring it back to me or anything like that. But I, I, we, we, we do see the same thing. Um, and so I, I don't know. It's it's cool to see like. In a lot of ways, we're very similar um, mm-hmm. types of businesses. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want your subscriber count someday, man. That would be. <laughs> you just got to be consistent. You guys are pretty consistent, though. I guess you know, but yeah. And I, th- um, I think that's part of like the success of it is going back to what you're talking about, like having a, a person in front of the camera. It's for whatever reason, it seems like people want to to be involved or it feels more personal. I guess, I guess it makes sense, right? It's more personal if there's a person in front of you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's just something there's something there about like people are endeared to people. And so when it comes to translating that to a YouTube channel, when there's a person in front, and you're, you're attempting to be as, as as authentic as you can, it seems like it leads to more subscribers, I think. I would I would agree. And like we've, I don't know, we've discussed this a lot. It's like, how do we add a more personal touch um, to to the channel? And, you know, I think the answer is obvious. It's, it's like digging a ditch. It's simple, but it's really hard, right? right. So it's like, you know, Okay, be, find somebody really person uh, personable and charismatic, and have them like show you how to make a boot or something like that. But like, right. that's is that me? You know, I mean, got a lot going on. You know, so it's like yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I I don't know. I'm um, impressed by by oh, thank you. kind of juggle all the different different things while also being the the face of the business on you know in such a prominent. Oh, thank you. I, it's definitely a strain on my life. You know, like I, I don't remember the last time I worked a 40 hour work week was probably six years ago when I worked at somewhere else seven years ago. So it's, it's one of these things. And that's, that's the other, that's the, the other side of the coin that sucks is if you are the face of the business and you own the business and you have to run the business and design the products and come up with the concepts and script, script things and do final approvals, you don't have hardly any time left. And when you become the personal bottleneck of your own business and your employees are depending on you performing in front of a camera on a regular basis in order for them to have a job, it adds a lot of extra stress that it's, it is what it is. I'm, I'm happy with where we're at. I, would, I wouldn't change it for the world, but it is a very stressful thing having all that on your plate. So yeah. to some degree, I'm envious of your position of being able to be the boss. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, it's funny. I mean, yeah, no, I appreciate that. This podcast thing is like, I enjoy it, but it's like, okay, we're filming, we'll, we're filming Thursday, man, you know? And so it's yeah. like, it's what I find is like, if you're a good boss, you're not really in charge, you know? And if you're, right. you're just kind of like, you're kind of doing what has to be done, whether you want to do it or not. Dude, and we have such an awesome team right now. Like, this is the first time that we've had a pretty self-sustaining and running business that could run without me. And dude, my team is like, I've, I'm really, really fortunate with the team I have right now. So shout out to the Rose Anvil team. They absolutely kill it. They're so awesome. Nice. I'm like, I like, go, I go home at night sometimes. And I'll be like, sit, honestly, to be completely honest, I'll be sitting in the shower contemplating my life and existence generally, you know? And I'll be like, man, I got an awesome team. Like, and so that's another part of it is like your, the people that you bring in either make or break it too. Oh, and yeah. yeah. So, and I'm sure you guys see that even more so cause you guys well, have it's, a it's significantly larger critical. business. Yeah. It's absolutely critical. And I don't know if you could exist without it, you know, mm-hmm. you couldn't, um, because you know, one person can only do so much. So yeah, both awesome teams and shout out to, to Rose Anvil and Nick's and Kelsey. I know you're listening. Thank you for being a great producer. Yeah. Shout out to Kelsey killing it behind the black screen. <laughs> um, so you talked about your, your background in business, um, as a business major, um, you talked a little bit about, um, what kind of drove you into being an entrepreneur, um, at least on the YouTube side, um, what was kind of that impetus on the, the small goods production side? So I know you, we've talked, I know you a little bit, you've been a fire, wildland firefighter in the past in your life. Um, and you were also, I'm assuming the flipping the motorcycles was like your own 
deal, right? You were kind of running that. Yeah. Uh, where did you kind of get that bug? When did you realize, hey, like I can do this? You know, I kind of want to be my own boss, et cetera. Well, my 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 parents are entrepreneurs, so I, I got it from my dad and my mom. You know, my dad is my dad when I was a little kid was an independent truck driver, a semi driver. And then he saw some opportunity in the industry that he was in, which was trucking huge loads of hay from farmers to dairies, local r- runs from one state to another. And he's like, you know what? I'm out here already. I could easily be testing this hay, show it to the lab or like have it tested in labs and then get these dairies exactly the hay that they need because hay you, th- you would assume that when hay is grown, hay is just hay, but there's different mineral levels. There's, there's different protein oh. levels. There's different, there's a lot to hay and it doesn't matter as much if you're just eating it or you're feeding it to like your family cow or whatever. But when you're a dairy, there's such stringent, um, guide or uh, st- stringent, uh, parameters. You have to have your milk, uh, tested within with protein levels and vitamin D levels and this level that the only way you adjust that is the in input, which is the hay. And so these, these, uh, hay growers at the time and these dairies didn't have a lot of connection They you know, they, they kind of know each other independently and then they would independently, or that like they then themselves would have to drive out, test the hay, send it to a, a tester and all this stuff. And so my dad's like, you know what? I could be the middleman. I'm already running these loads of hay. I could just test these and then t- take them to the dairies and be like, okay, you need 15 bales of this. You need 10 bales of this, five bales of this. We're putting on this truck. It's going to be to you in four days. We take our cut off the top. We facilitate it for you. Done. And so in my dad's probably mid to late thirties, he pivoted towards that away from being a truck driver and also still being a truck driver, I guess, at the same time, and made a pretty good business out of it, you know? And it, so, like, when I was a kid, you know, I was, I, was, I was raised with the truck driver's salary, and then as we grew a little bit older, the business started doing better, and and to the point where um, when I was in high school, my, my, my family was doing okay, you know, far from, like, upper middle class by any means, but, like, we'd gone from a truck driving small family to my dad's success had made us uh, made us okay. And so I saw that all growing up, and I and I... I more importantly saw what it's like to be an entrepreneur's son and the free labor that goes into being an entrepreneur's son, which include working on the farm from eight years old, helping with the construction business, um, build like anytime anything needed to be built, we were always part of that. And we're also, I was from a Mormon community. So anytime there was anything going on, we were like all the neighbors, cause we, we lived right next to the church. So anytime you had to scrape the snow off the church, uh, sidewalks, anytime there was a project going on. And cause we were big, we're a big family. Like I'm six foot four. My little brother was like basically my whole size growing up. So the whole time growing up, they'd be like, Oh yeah, we're like framing this house. Go grab the K boys. And so we did a <laughs> knock on the door at like 7 AM and my dad go answer it. Oh yeah. You need the boys. And my dad bust open the door. Hey, get up. You got to go help. So-and-so they're framing a house. They need you for this. And, I, and we'd be like, Oh, are you kidding me? I'm 12. You know? <laughs> And so I got a lot of that entrepreneurial spirit from my dad and that hard work and mentality from my, my dad and my mom, because my mom was an entrepreneur too. I think she just doesn't, you know, it's a typical thing where the dad gets all the shine. Meanwhile, the mom's supporting them and helping with the business. But, um, and I also learned through being an entrepreneur's son that it sucks just working for free and there's gotta be a better way to do this kind of situation. And so when I was, when I was 14, I started teaching guitar lessons and I was like, I can make 20 bucks an hour teaching guitar lessons instead of 10 cents a pipe. I'm for sure doing that. And so I just had the the perfect situation where I learned to work hard. I hated working hard. I learned the benefits of working smarter and took the working hard attributes into the working smarter. And I did guitar lessons all growing up. And then I, in college, I, you know, I, cause I really only had like one real job because everything else has been either involved in someone else's entrepreneurial support, like my dad's, or my own entrepreneurial thing. Um, the only job I've really ever had that was clocking in and clocking out was the Spring Hill Suites Marriott in Logan, Utah. Okay. And I was the maintenance man and I went in at 4 a.m. And uh, let's just say the hotel was running, but it could have been maintained a little bit better by 21 year old me. <laughs> so, but that's that's honestly where, like that was my last, my last, uh, the last time I was like, Oh, I'm making this manager a lot more money and I'm keeping this, this whole hotel afloat because like I wasn't the best maintenance man, but I went to every single room, dealt with all the issues of, of the customers and like single handedly kept this, this whole building afloat. And so 
to me, I was like, oh, sick, I'm making $12 an hour. Meanwhile, the, the general manager is like sitting on his butt in his room watching Netflix and getting after employees and making $100,000 a year. And I was like, F this, I'm done with this. I'll, I'd rather strike out on my own and do it by myself than, than work for this guy. And that was the last real job I ever had. And I think I was like 21 or something, 22. Yeah, man, it sounds like you're kind of raised for it. Um, yeah, it's, I'm very fortunate. I, so huge thanks to my my parents for that. You know, for better or for worse, um, your upbringing shapes you. And uh, I was just fortunate to have a, a pretty good one. Um, what's the biggest challenge facing the Roseanneville business right now? The biggest problem facing the business? Honestly, the business is doing really well right now and it's clicking really well and we've got a lot of potential. Um, the biggest thing that's a pain point for me on a regular basis is that we just can't do everything that I wanna do all at once. Like I have yeah. so many projects that we're halfway in between and so many products I wanna release and so many things in the works that um, the biggest sticking point for me personally is just that I just wish that I could do everything all at once and I had more time to do what I want instead of doing like administrative work or like business, uh, back end business work. So I guess freeing up my time to do more of what I want to do is uh, the biggest pain point. Yeah, I'm sure there's other bigger, like actual business pain points, but like, no, it's, whole, it's, you know, I think that's, that's fair. I mean, like I, if you were to ask me that, I'd be like, well, we just can only grow so fast, like, yeah. and still maintain quality and, you know, still be good, you know? So it's kind of the same thing, right? Like it just takes time to train people and get them on board. And you know, anyway, yeah, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, any, anything specifically you've yet to achieve with the Roseanneville business that you wish you had or, or think you will either way? The, the ultimate goal of all this, and I've like talked about this throughout the few years on the channel, and it's been a dream of mine since I was basically a teenager, is to have the dream shop. It's this, this uh, concept basically combining Rob Deerdeck's Fantasy Factory with the Home Depot, with, uh, with the Rose Anvil YouTube channel by making this giant warehouse that has a woodworking area, a completely kitted out with all the best woodworking stuff, all the lumber you'd need, all the screws, everything, a complete wood or metal working area with like welders, all the different types, the sheet metal you need, everything at your disposal, the like the, all the, just everything, the machining, all that stuff. Um, and then I want like an automotive section where it's like, I got a lift with all my tools and stuff and like a bike lift, a, a car lift, everything you need for that. I want a pottery um, corner. Like I just want, I want the dream shop to be like uh, Ron Swanson's dr wet dream come true. Like that's what I want. And, yeah. and I think it's possible. I, and the whole, all of this is leading towards that. So many people are in this game for fame, for the money, for Ferraris, whatever it happens to be. I just want a place where it could be the mecca of making. I want people to be able to come in and, and use the equipment if they need it. I want all my employees to be able to follow their own personal passions. I want to be able to lock up the doors from Saturday to Sunday and not have to leave and go to Home Depot 20 times to finish a project. I just want I just want it to be the perfect making area that also maybe has a little bit of a, a half pipe in it. it. Might have a little bit of a climbing wall, maybe a pool, maybe a sauna, maybe an entire Joe Rogan experience, like workout room with the sauna, with the cold sure. plunge and all the athletic greens and steroids on tap whenever you need them. That's, that's the dream shop. Maybe not the steroids, but uh, that's the dream. That's where all this is headed. And we're going to document it on the channel because um, we're, getting, we're getting within striking distance of it becoming more of a reality. You know, the channel's really working. We're making some decent money. We need some other bigger things to happen in order to really afford it because it's going to be anywhere between a 10 and $20 million project. Yeah. And so... It is a lofty goal, but I think it's an achievable goal. And I think with the help of the channel, and I, I think with uh, a singular goal on a singular focus on that singular goal, anything's possible if you put your mind to it, in my opinion, especially with how far down the road we already are. That's right, man. That's right. Um, have you seen, like, you know, Fireball Tool? I know Fireball Whiskey. Okay, so you should check out Fireball Tools. <laughs> he's, he's a local guy. He does uh, metalworking. And so, like... Okay. Um, he, he has a line of like uh, vices and, and stuff like that, but he, he did us. It's not quite to what you're talking about, but it's, um, 
it's a, uh, a big, basically warehouse that he bought and you know, built out here in Spokane. And he does all his filming there. It's got a huge like gantry, you know, lifting whatever you want. It's got a hangout area. Um, I bet you can do it for less than $20 million, million now. That's yeah, $20 Yeah, mil- $20 million is definitely the top end. But like how, how sick would it be, even for you guys, to book a flight out to Salt Lake. Five minutes from the airport is the shop. We've got a, a little apartment in there for you guys to stay in. We've got a little kitchen. And then you have access to hundreds of shoes and boots cut in half to sit down for a, an entire three-day span and go through everything that's happened over the last 30 years of footwear and actually be able to see that, fill it, look at the test results, look at the materials, measurements, and it'll be like a once, it'll be like the most comprehensive footwear library in the world that yeah. like professionals yeah. can come out to even visitors like if someone's like the biggest sneakerhead in the world and they want to come out and visit the shop and see everything like i want to be able to share a lot of this with everybody because as much fun as it is making your own dreams come true it's a lot sweeter if you can bring people with you and you can you can have other people have access to your dreams and help make their dreams come true for lack yeah, of a sick, less you, cringy like, term well whatever i mean <laughs> but like life is about feelings as much as we yeah. hate to say it, right? Like we do actually have them. Um, and yeah, man, I, I think that's awesome. Like just this amazing R and D, um, location. Um, that's what, what's, I don't know that that's, that's a really great goal. <laughs> I wish, I wish I had that. <laughs> goal. Um, uh, other thought is like, we've kind of harped on this a little bit, but like, I just, just watching you over the last couple of years and getting to know you, like, you know, do you ever stop to think about how impressive what you've done is, you know, you talk maybe sitting in the shower, but like, I don't know, is there any, I struggle with that sometimes. And I'm kind of, yeah, do you ever, like, I, give I just impression? don't like thinking about it, to be honest, it starts to freak me out. And, uh, I'm a little bit afraid of losing the edge if I like really was able to like understand it for what it is. So I just kind of put it in the, on the back burner. I was like, I'll be, and it's maybe not the healthiest thing, you know, to like not enjoy your success while it's happening. I don't know. I just, there's a, equal parts. I don't want to become cocky and arrogant. I don't want to become lazy because of the success. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to count my eggs or my chickens before they've hatched type of situation. So no, I think no, all no. three of those things kind of deter me from, yeah my head getting too big, I guess, but I wish, I wish I was able to appreciate it a little bit more. I, I, that's something I definitely lack when in my character is being able to really sit down and be like, look at what we've done. Like, how sick is this? Good job us. And even, even in saying that, I can't even say me, right? Like I can't even be like, look at what I've done because it just feels gross. It feels weird because it wasn't just me. And it's, I don't know. It's just, it's weird. I don't know. I try to enjoy it and be happy with it, but I just, I can't do it as much as other people for some reason. Um, well, yeah, I think there's, I, yeah, I, I think com- being complacent is kind of what I worry about. And so yeah. it's like, you know, I don't know. I was, I joke sometimes with my team and I wonder if it's too much, but I'm like, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> you know? It's true. It's like, <laughs> we we got to keep, we got to keep pushing. But, uh, well, one, one of these, one time I was, uh, I was on a call with a brand and this is like none of the brands that like that we deal with. This is some like other brand that was a startup or something. And we got in a call with them and the guy's just like, yeah, so this, this, and this, and this is this, and I want to do this and the future of the business is this. And I want to launch this video this time. And like, I get off the phone with the guy and I like look at the other two or three people that are on the call with us. And I was like, dang, check out this guy's freaking manic energy. I wish this guy would chill out. Like these entrepreneurs, they're way too crazy manic energy for me. They drive me insane. And my entire team just goes like this. <laughs> and I'm like, what is everyone looking at? And I'm like, oh, that's me, isn't it? Fuck. And they're like, yeah, that's you to a freaking T, bro. And I was like, oh, dang it. And so there is like that weird, like, manic y, like, um, live or die kind of mentality when it comes to entrepreneurs. Like, it's all or nothing. Because in order to get to a point where you're successful, you literally have to beat out everyone that's trying what you're trying and do it better, do it faster, do it more and more, you know? And so it is a very competitive thing because as much as you think your idea of cutting boots in half is an original idea, it's not. Nix has been doing it for the entire time they've been around. Red Wing's been doing it. Um, Heddles did a cut in half video. This is like something we went over in the Q&A, so it's just on top of my mind, you know? And so it's like, and so even like Stridewise, like Stridewise is a good buddy of mine. 
Like one time he's out here, he's like, hey, that was my idea. I was going to cut boots in half and you beat me to it. And I was like, hey, you've been doing it for five years. Why didn't you do it? He's like, yeah, that's the point. I didn't do it. So screw you, you know, and just like fun banter like that. And so it's like, no matter how original you think your idea is, there's 20 people working on the same idea at the same time. And so you just have to be, you have to work harder. You have to work smarter, faster, harder, and be the one on top or have the best product out of the bunch. And that's usually who wins. And so when it comes to that energy that entrepreneurs put out, it's that crazy over the top energy a lot of times that just like they're willing to grind for 80 hours a week and seven days a week. And it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny uh, group of people, us entrepreneurs. And I think that's why we all get along pretty well. How long are you going to do it? You think? How long can well, you? Well, with the dream shop, the so I've kind of broken. Um, I broke down my entire like career with this pretty early on when I first did it because I sat down with my parents after the uh, first Kickstarter of the Claude Wallet. I sat down with my parents because I was close to graduating, and I was like, "Hey, I think I'm going to give this thing a good go. Like, I'm going to give this thing five years." And if I can't like make enough money in five years to justify not having a career in marketing or working for other other business and tech somewhere, I won't do it anymore. And my parents were like, are you sure you're going to make money leather working? And I was like, I don't know. I'm going to try. And so, and then the, so that was like the first five years was get the business running, get it making money. And then I'm basically at that point now, it's been five or six years since I took it really seriously. And so Goal number one reached. It's working. It's making money. It's employing people. We, we have a trajectory it's, I'm happy with. And then the next phase is five years of making money. Like, like, how do we take this platform that we've built and this business we've built and now make money and hopefully an ungodly amount of money for five years straight? And then from that point on, I just want it to be passion. I just want, I want to make enough money in a short enough period of time that I can pay off the dream shop. I can pay off all the equipment. I can get whatever cars and stuff that I need. And then I can just sit back and know that everything's handled, know that there's enough income coming in that I'll be happy and set for the most part for the rest of my life. And then just work on the stuff that I'm really passionate about. That's that's year, year 10 to the rest of my life. And that's why the Dream Shop is such a pivotal part of this plan, because that's the ultimate goal. I love footwear, I love leather, I love making. But from age 35, to 65 is the goal is to be in the dream shop doing the craziest the over yep. the top funnest most inventive things that you just can't make unless you have the dream shop and so i have a different trajectory and i have a very specific goal and i think that's kind of what's helped guide me and help me stay motivated because so many other people and it's not even a bad thing i'm not talking down on them because it's, i just got lucky um they have a very like ephemeral ethereal goal of like oh well, one day i want to be rich and famous and have lots of stuff and you're like cool good luck like how about some more specific goals you know so i think the more specific the goal the better and especially if you can figure out what it is that you enjoy intrinsically behind all the passions in your projects and your your, your hobbies and stuff and you can try to at least do some of that in your daily work at work then you're, you, no one's gonna love what they do for the rest of their life, but you'll get a lot closer, I think. So, I don't know. That's what that's what I've done, and it's worked. I'm only 32, so how, to take it with a grain of salt. I'm not like a, this super successful millionaire by any means. I just that's what I'm doing, and it's worked. So, well, it's you know the proof's in the pudding, as they say, and you um, have definitely accomplished a lot. So, you know, I don't know. Thank you. I, would, I will certainly take that to heart and um, urge urge anyone listening to do the same. Um, okay, man. Well, hey, thanks so much for what you've uh, you've given us. I really appreciate your honesty and your uh, your candor. Um, You're welcome. We do do you want to plug the um, ND three? Uh, yeah. Coming out? So do you want to talk be about so that? cool? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna leave some of the details out so that we can tease slowly drip feed them as we get some of the details figured out because it's not finished yet. But uh, yeah, the ND three is back. Shiler's and the boys are letting me go wild again. And that's why like the indie series is, is such a fun series because you guys are willing to like gamble on, on these boots because you guys are the ones that have to like deal with the customers and the warranties. And so it's really cool that you guys let me do what I want. And the Indy 3 is gonna be the evolution of the Indy series. Indy 1 was essentially the apocalypse boot. We took what Nick's made us for the world's most 
indestructible boot video and condensed it into something you could actually wear on a daily basis, but barely. The thing is super heavy. It's really over the top and it still works as an everyday boot, but it's heavy. And um, then we went to the ND2, which was like, okay, how do we refine this design? How do we start adding in some custom elements and, and make things a little bit different? Because the ND1, all we did was take Nick's existing components and we threw them on a boot platform and designed it a little bit here and there. But with the ND2, we wanted to make it more custom in a boot that you've never seen before. And that's why we did those two Rose Anvil designed lineman patches that yep. are supposed to cover that met knuckle. Um, because my thought was, the Indy one's the apocalypse boot. The Indy two is more of like your everyday apocalypse boot where you don't need the full lineman patch. You just need reinforcement in the high wear areas. It's a little bit lighter, a little more agile, reverse the colors. And so the Indy three is taking everything that we've learned from the Indy one and Indy two and making it a, a significantly better, more lightweight, more flexible, um, while still being over the top and dependable Indy three boot. It's just, yeah, the evolution of the Indy three. And it's going to be so cool. Um, and we're, yeah, and we've already teased one of the images, that image you sent me of uh, the, before it's been like bottomed and everything. First prototype, yep. <laughs> yeah, and so the first prototype's done, and so I'm, I'm sure you guys will tease it in the footage here, but we're, we're, we're bringing back the OG colorway of the black, or the brown wax flesh for the majority of it, and then just that little pop of color of the 1964 brown leather um, on the internal lineman patch, and, it's gonna be so sick. I think it's gonna do well. I'm excited for it. Like that's what I always, I don't do like, we because we've had offers for several collabs all the time really because because they're fun to do and people see the value of them. And so a lot of brands reach out, but unless I can find something that's actually new and different and interesting and can make a, make a boot that no one's ever made before, I don't have any interest in, do it, in doing it. And so that's why, you know, we only do a few select collabs a year, collabs. People get so mad at me for saying collab. I guess it's collab, but whatever. Really? Yeah, no. I, I've been saying collab, but you guys, I probably infected you guys with my that's, my poor Juab County that. English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, so it's it's cool. It's cool that you guys let me do it, so I, I appreciate it. It's, it's fun to do. Well, yeah, we're super excited. Um, we'll be getting that, uh, getting that out, and we'll get you the second version here shortly. I think that'll be right on the button cool. uh, and um yeah man it's gonna be huge again weston i can't thank you enough we're right at that hour mark it's perfect um cool. and uh thanks so much for your time I really appreciate yeah, you're it you're welcome yeah i feel All like right. i feel like we just barely scratched the surface so anytime you guys want me on just let me know it's easy to do I have half my questions left so yeah we've yeah. definitely got some fodder for the uh, for the next time but yeah cool. listen and everyone thank you for listening we really appreciate it we will see you next time <laughs>